Mutant kind is under attack by Orchis from every conceivable angle, and the only way they're going to get out of this is if they get real creative real soon. What'll happen next? Well, let's hop into the pages of X-Men issue number 27 and find out what happens next together, shall we? Alrighty then, so as we join the book, we check back on in with Shadowcat. Kitty is continuing to use her phase powers and elite ninja skills to pull off some very important stealth missions for the rest of the X-Men, like doing a head count at the Gyrich Institute. The special new mutant prison where it seems that Orchis is holding all of the most powerful and potentially dangerous mutants that they didn't send off to Mars. Though it's not just mutants either, as Kitty ends up coming face to face with Juggernaut, who actually survived the attack by Nimrod at the Hellfire Gala, though he hasn't been able to break out yet because of the adamantium collar they've affixed him with. It gets deeper and more sinister too. Marco says that his collar is actually connected to the prisoner in the next room, and should he try and pull a Kool-Aid man and break the walls down, he'd only be decapitating the guy next door, who Kitty soon's discover is actually Cyclops, who is looking a little worse for wear right now. Dr. Stasis has been drugging him, torturing him, and in a grim bit of irony has sewed his eyes shut, meaning he can't use his trademark concussive blasts. Also, if you thought Kitty could have just rescued him right now all easy like, you would be totally wrong. Apparently, the special X-shaped gurney that Scott is on is actually a bomb, and any attempt to remove him from it would activate the dead man switch and no doubt kill him. So sadly, it looks like Shadowcat is going to have to leave Cyclops behind. Before she goes, though, she's sure to phase Juggernaut out of his collar so that he can have a chance to escape. Now, it's not just recon that Kitty was doing at the prison. She was also sure to go through Orchis's evidence locker and come back to the more locked tunnels with a broken Cerebro helmet. The rebel mutants hope that if they can fix it up, Rasputin 4 can use her own mental powers to hopefully get them a very important piece of intel. Hidden away within the mind of Mr. Fantastic of the Fantastic Four, Kitty isn't joining them for this mission because, well, if you remember that last X-Men Fantastic Four miniseries, there's a lot of bad blood between the families right now. The appendix pages in this issue, too, also do a good job painting just how powerful Rasputin 4 is. Yes, she has the abilities of five different ultra-powerful mutants inside her, but her abilities are actually a little less than any of those mutants would be individually. So she's strong and impenetrable Blight Colossus, but not that strong and impenetrable. She has mental powers like Emma Frost, but they're not that good. She can move a car, though. And considering that Mutant Kind doesn't exactly have access to the Blackbird right now, it looks like flying by mentally projected car is probably as good as it's gonna get for the foreseeable future. Another interesting thing about this issue is that Miss Marvel Kamala Khan is actually tagging along for this mission, seeing that she's involved in the mutant goings-on, not just in her own book, but also in the main X-Men title as well. And you know what, with Kitty and all of the other mutants being darker, more serious revolutionaries right now, having her essentially fill the void of fun, peppy young woman is actually much appreciated. Now, where are the Fantastic Four right now? Well, they're not in New York. If you've been reading that Ryan North series, you'll know that the shit hit the fan for them as well. They lost the Baxter building and their children, and they're currently hiding out on Ben Grimm's family's old farm. Here's the other thing, too. Rasputin 4 is from an evil alternate sinister future, one wherein the original Fantastic Four died thousands of years before she was even born. Because of that, she actually doesn't have much respect or revenance for the first family. As far as Rasputin sees it, if Professor X in all of his wisdom had gone out of his way to obfuscate a piece of information from Reed Richards' mind for the benefit of mutant kind, it must be because Mr. Fantastic and the rest of the Fantastic Four must not be friends to mutant kind, which naturally leads to a whole lot of friction that Miss Marvel has to try and get in between. Between. They have a lot of fun, too, with just how smart Reed Richards is. He pegs Rasputin for basically the second he sees her. Ah, you're a time-traveling mutant from an alternate future, huh? A chimera of sorts with four, no, five power sets. Understandably, the Richards family is a little slow to help mutant kind. Like I said, they're dealing with their own problems right now, but also Reed has a real issue with the whole Xavier messing with his mind and trying to recruit his Omega-level son back when they thought Franklin was still a mutant and no sadly they don't go back and rectify any of that in this issue, even though I really thought they might. It's after some good-natured goading they finally agree to let Rasputin 4 inside Reed's mind to find what they're looking for. Which, in case you didn't already catch on, is the secret to masking the mutant's X-gene, meaning so that the Stark Sentinels couldn't track them down wherever they are. Here's the problem, though. After poking around in Reed's head for a little bit, Rasputin realizes that this important piece of information just wasn't 
wasn't obfuscated by Professor X, it was actively cut out of Reed's mind. Which sadly means this whole mission was for naught and everyone's back to square one. That is, of course, until Kamala mentions that her and Professor X had a conversation about her own unique inhuman mutant hybrid genes at the Hellfire Gala before the shit hit the wall. It's right then the light bulb goes off in Reed's head. The secret to masking mutant genes actually lies within inhuman Terrigen Mist. In the past, the mist was enough to make mutants sick or even outright kill them, but surely enough focused doses should make the mutant freedom fighters invisible to Orchis. I mean, they've already kind of seen it work with Kamala, right? Reed even offers to help Kamala unlock her mutant powers, whatever they might be, though. In a nice bit of characterization, Miss Marvel is actually slow to accept help from either Mr. Fantastic or the White Queen, fearing what a new mutant power might be for her and what it might mean for her future. Reed and the four vow to get right to work on trying to make something to help the mutants mask their gene. Yes, they were mad at mutant kind for what went down in the bulk of Krakoa, but the mutants are really in trouble right now. A friend in need is a friend indeed, and the Richards know a thing or two about really going through the ringer right now. So everyone's just gonna help everyone, and the world's gonna be a much better place for it. As the comic comes to a close, we check on in with Dr. Stasis. It turns out that Juggernaut actually failed his escape attempt. Once again, getting stopped by Nimrod. However, Stasis is now fascinated by the Crimson Gem of Sightrack and plans to remove it surgically before implanting it in himself. Yes, that's right, everybody. Make way for Dr. Juggernaut. And so that was X-Men issue number 27, everyone. And overall, I thought this was a fun little one-and-done issue. Obviously, there was a lot of unresolved tension between the X-Men as a team and a species and the Fantastic Four, and it's nice to see them mostly work through it here in this issue, even if some of the bigger questions, mostly in involving Franklin remain unresolved. It's nice to see Rasputin 4 get some more characterization here. She's kind of been slumbering since the ends of Sins of Sinister. Kamala Khan actually plays the Kitty Pride Jubilee role in the team quite well. Yes, it's annoying the steps they took to get her on the team and make her a mutant and everything, but hey, they're making the most out of it right now, and your inhuman heritage even gets called back here as something that might actually help save all of mutant kind. It's also kind of nice, too, to see this time around when mutants are being hunted and hated and feared and villainized by an evil organization, the Avengers and the Fantastic Four are actually doing everything in their power to help them out of this jam and the writers don't have to contrive a reason for why they can't be seen helping mutant kind. And well, it's just nice to see all the heroes in the universe pulling in one direction, isn't it? It also makes this X-Men story and the threat of Orchis feel so much bigger because it's affecting all these different books and all these different teams at once. Overall, I would give this one a 7.5 out of 10. Not the most jaw-dropping issue I've ever read in this series, but still pretty damn good. Hey there everyone, it's your old pal Cape Jewel again, thanking you so much for watching to the end of the video. I hope you enjoyed it, and if you did, why not check out my Amazon link down in the description. Yes, that's right, the Cape Jewel channel officially has its own Amazon storefront now. You can pick up a comic or anything else for that matter, and if you did, you'd really be helping me in the channel. So with that out of the way everyone, I will see you again next time. Bye bye